Please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. William Cooper. Thanks. Thank you. I will. So make sure we do a sound check. Can everybody hear me okay? Chris, it's actually a stupid question, right? Because if you can't hear me, you're not going to raise your hand anyway. So um, tonight, uh, I'm going to take my hat off as the water boy on campus and turn it into the butterfly boy on campus. And uh, what we're going to try to do is we're going to, so this is the flag of Argentina, in case you didn't know. And, you know, most everybody goes to Iguazu Falls to see the falls. They have, of course, my enemy, because I've got $1,000 worth of photographic equipment, or a little bit more than that, uh, hanging around my neck. And, and uh, to go out here uh, is, is very dangerous because you can see all the mist that comes up from those falls. So I actually went out there, looked, and ran back and, and continued to photograph the butterflies. This, by the way, is Brazil. So if you don't know where Iguazu is, it's in the northern part of Argentina. You fly into Buenos Aires. You then uh, go over to the national uh, airport, which is over by the river, and then you fly about an hour and a half north. So to give you an idea, we're at 24 degrees south latitude, okay? We here tonight are sitting at about 34 degrees north latitude. Miami, Florida is at about 24 degrees north latitude. So we're about 600 miles north of where 24 would be here uh, in Southern California. Well, that would actually be Mexico. But at any rate, so this is my enemy, but this is why, this is why everybody else, what? Sorry? Oh, they want to turn the lights down a little bit. Thank you. We'll get, we'll get adjusted here. We haven't seen any butterflies yet. So, so the real question that, I, that I'm sure you're wondering is, what the heck am I doing photographing butterflies and why at Iguazu? First of all, let me tell you a little bit about Iguazu Falls, Argentina. It's in northern Argentina, borders Brazil. And if I, I might have, I get too excited when I give this talk. This is Brazil over here, okay? So the Brazilian side um, is, is beautiful, but I really am in love with the Argentine side um, because I live, this is out of the window of the Sheraton Hotel at Iguazu Falls. So this is, this is looking out. Um, so you can see why I love it there. And when you're doing things like nature, you just walk outside. And I, I've actually got a picture of a bird that greeted me every morning there. Um, but it, it's absolutely magnificent. It's about a, it's a very large uh, nature preserve. Um, and it's, so it's subtropical, and they're petitioning for Iguazu Falls. The falls itself is 1.4 uh, kilometers long. It's about a mile all the way around, so it's much bigger than any falls that we have here. Interestingly enough, from a butterfly person's point of view, there's about 400 species of butterflies that live in and around Iguazu Falls. And... Um, and they come in all colors, and it is truly a butterfly uh, natural wonder of the world, for sure. My biggest problem is where to start. Well, actually, this story begins in 1983, if you can believe that, when I was a, a, a professor at Florida International University, and my first graduate student, Jose Lopez, was from Argentina, and it turned out I got an invitation to go to a conference in Buenos Aires, and actually was talking about renewable energy, if you can imagine that, in 1983. Um, so, and then we went, but then in, in a matter of a week, I think we got 10 hours of sleep. So uh, obviously I got very cold, I got a bad cold at the end of the week, but I gave a whole bunch of lectures. So Jose would translate them from English to Spanish, and we had quite a, we had quite a, a duo going. We went up to Misiones, where uh, is, is in northern uh, Argentina, and we drove over to Iguazu. And the thing that got me going was when we went to Iguazu, little Ocho Ocho landed on my hand. So Ocho Ocho, that's 88 in Spanish. And, and you can see it's got a good 88 right there. And the butterfly actually landed on my hand in 1983. And I said, I've got to come back here to do butterfly photography. So let me just go back into my a previous life. What I was doing, I actually took my first butterfly photograph when I was in 1972. And when you've got two little testosterone devils, that's boys, running around your house, to try to collect butterflies and pin them becomes almost impossible. So I gave them the net, and I actually went into photography in 1972. I was at then a, uh, eventually an officer and then a civilian in the Army, 
and I was invited to give a talk at an Audubon Club Society meeting on butterflies. I then actually, there were a couple of people from the Maryland Entomological Society that were, were at the talk, and they said, oh, you've got to join the Maryland Entomological Society. So I joined. And interestingly enough, when you're around Washington, you have an inordinate amount of, of people that love insects, namely at the Smithsonian. Well, as it turns out, one thing led to the next, and the next thing I knew, I was giving a course in butterfly photography at the Smithsonian's Environmental Research Center and, and uh, have been doing butterfly photography ever since. And in six and a half years, when I retire, I'm going to do it full time. So this is little Ocho Ocho, and you'll see that he or she will pop up in a number of the pictures as we go. But like in all good stories, we should start with the tea party. So this is my butterfly tea party. You can see here butterflies. There's one flying away there. I scared him. But you can, here's a little ocho ocho right here. But you can see back here the yellow swallowtails, magnificent butterflies that are about this big. And um, here's just another shot of these guys. Look at this. This is probably, as a water boy, probably sewage because it's right next to the outhouse. And I think it's leaking, but it makes a wonderful place to have butterflies because they get both their, their water and their salts, okay? So, and it smells absolutely delightful to a butterfly. So here's another picture. And you're going along and watching these things and then all of a sudden something happens and look at that. So I asked Susan, we decided that's mauve. I've never quite figured out what mauve is other than the name of some people that I know. But, the, but that's close to, to a moth. But can you imagine when you're sitting here and this butterfly comes down and, oh, my God, it's black and it's got this gorgeous pinkish mauvish color here. And it's just amazing. And we'll go through some of, the, some of the anatomy of the butterflies. But basically, this is the proboscis and this is how they get just like an elephant's trunk. And you'll see some along the way. So let's go back to our little story. Here's a little Ocho Ocho. And I have a picture of Paramini on my finger so you can see the size of this butterfly. This butterfly is about that big. So it's really a very small butterfly. And I know probably some of you are wondering, how the hell do you get those pictures? Well, the way you do that is you use a 200 millimeter telephoto with a 25 millimeter extension tube on it. And you run around with, I have my, my brief, my, my back sack there because I, I have this and I use it in a 50 millimeter lens as well. And you can, if you want to see this, you can see what this does is when I first started doing this, these guys are very tame. I mean, really tame. But you have to normally, with normal butterflies, you have to be a long way away. So the only way you could do that is to use a telephoto lens and make it a close up lens. And you do that with this 25 millimeter extension tube right in here. Okay. When I first started back in the 70s, of course, not only were the cameras not automatic, I had a bellows. And so I would set the bellows and then I would focus with my body like this. But then I was using slides, so I'd go click, 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 and then I'd go click, 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 click. But I didn't do that because I didn't have an auto wind. So I'd go click, 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 like this. Then I got an auto wind, which made it better, but I still only got about one slide out of a hundred that was worth it. And this is all digital. So I would spend, in, in five days, I took 5,600 photographs <laughs> of 99 species of butterflies. And it, it, so it was only five days taking the photographs, but it was about 12 days classifying them all. I have three books all in Spanish. I'm very fluent in Spanish, by the way. <laughs> um, and uh, but luckily, the pictures are good. So then I would actually, uh, and you'll see, I've tried to actually give you the this, this scientific name in the, in the common name as we go along. But you can see here, this is the proboscis. And if you don't realize, this is actually the handrail going up and down the stairs at Iguazu. And, and, as, and, and of course, it's because it's subtropical. A lot of people are sweating, and you end up with oil and stuff on there and salts. So what the butterflies do is they sit there and actually suck off the oil and the salts for their bodies. This is another little Ocho Ocho. And it, it, the thing is that they say, how do you take these beautiful pictures? You don't. I mean, it's, it's just normal. I mean, the butterflies are gorgeous, and they just, you just find them on these different, different situations. So this, is, so this is the genus, species, and the, and the subspecies, if you will, of Ocho Ocho Azur. And the reason this is called Azur is two, twofold. One, it has um, blue on the wing here instead of two different colors. 
But the other thing is, doesn't really know how to make an eight very well. So, so they didn't give him a full ocho ocho, you know, it's ocho ocho azure. But, uh, uh, so that's another one of these little guys. Now this is Paramini. This is the one that's actually on the, uh, on the, the, uh, the uh, folder and stuff. And you can see this little, uh, the little proboscis again, his little eyes checking me out. The antennae. And notice here on the upper wing. So, you know, you've got four wings, the upper and the lower wings. These are the lower wings here in the upper wings. You see the red here and the blue here. And when you see the top of this butterfly, here it is on the top, red, and the, and the bottom is blue. And, you know, I have to tell you, you don't ever get, if you're a butterfly guy, and you're in Guazoo, you, you first of all, you hardly sleep. Because when I took, I took over a thousand, well, I was there for five days and took 5,600 photographs. Had I had, which I should have done, I should have had another memory card, I could have had almost 8,000 photographs. <laughs> As it was, it took me two hours to just download them off of my camera onto the computer every night. And this is not really one of those, uh, it, it's not really a, a sport that's, that's, a, that's a many people sport. It's really kind of you and the butterflies. But it's amazing if you have observational skills, which I've honed over my 40 years of doing research, it's amazing how much you can learn about these butterflies and, and understand what they're doing. Uh, they actually talk to me. So I actually, you might even see me out there talking to some of these guys once in a while. There's my finger. That's the size of that guy. So he's sitting on my finger. They say, how the heck do you get him on your finger? It's actually very easy. These, they, you know, you see, you can see him right here. He's, he's got his little proboscis here. He's, he's drinking my saliva. So I just go like this, and I literally put my finger under the butterflies, and they come up on my finger. Well, that's actually this finger. Because here I have to put my 50-millimeter lens on. So I've got the butterfly here, and I've got my camera like this. And believe it or not, I've got some of the prettiest pictures of these bloody things on my finger. But that doesn't make for a very nice picture to show people. It's fun when you're showing people like this because it gives you an idea of how small these little guys are. This is Paraguazu. Uh, again, you see this genus and species and the subspecies here. I didn't get a really good picture of this one, but it's interesting here how, first of all, I don't know if you can see it, but the proboscis actually curls like this. And you can see it has right here. Let me get my little dot here. Whoops. I lost my... Right here, you see, all of them are about the same. They all have this little crook right there. And, of course, then they just curl up. And I'll show you some. Um, but what's really fun, when you're looking through the camera at these things and they're so close, you can see the beautiful, intricate designs on their antennae. Some are, some are like little zebras and some have got little red or yellow spots, some of them are blue spots, and everybody's got their own little take on what they should be. So here we go. Here's a turquoise, and again, this one's on my finger, and I'm taking it. So this is really a pain. You get the bloody thing on your finger, then you've got to take that telephoto off and put the 50 millimeter on while the, finger, while the butterfly's on your finger. So I didn't drop any of the lenses, but you wonder sometimes how you don't do it. But this is, this is an amazing butterfly. That's what that butterfly looks like from the underside. It's difficult to imagine that when you see something like that, that, and the way to remember to see these white spots right here, there's three white spots right there. Watch this. There they are right there. One, two, three. And so when you see a photograph like this, and you're trying to determine what species it is, you gotta look for all those little clues so you can see what it is, because a lot of times in these books, they actually kill the butterfly, they open it up, and they photograph the top of it. But that you don't always see the top of it. There's a lot of butterflies that you, well, when we get to the, to the, to the, the blue morpho, you'll see, you'll never see the top of it until it flies. So here's another one you can see. Here's his little antennae, see that? I mean, antennae, uh, proboscis. It's uncurling. So this is the dark Juno here. Again, the, 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 uh, uh, oh, oh, I made a mistake. That's supposed to be a little J. Um, but again, you can see the proboscis here, and he's in this, in this water. I'm not sure exactly where that is, but that's what it looks like from the top. I mean, literally, you got every, every possible color in the, in the, uh, uh, that you can imagine on these guys. Now, that one is about this big. 
Okay, it's a very long and narrow butterfly. And this is again, this reminds me of uh, what we have here in the United States called the Gulf Fritillary. We have them here around in, in Southern California. It's, it's, in the, it's in the family of heliconids. And you can see, this is a really good picture of him actually taking some water or salts off of this rock. This is a Julia. And this, I, I have seen the Julia in Florida when I was in Miami. Um, I, that's one of the three heliconids in the United States. You have the Julia, the zebra butterfly. There's also a zebra swallowtail. And then you have the Gulf Fritillary. Those are the three heliconids. It's really fun. I had it all set up and we couldn't get funded. To go down the Amazon, there are heliconids that, that at the top of the Amazon, where you're at three or 4,000 or 5,000 or 8,000 feet, They've got, they look just like this. They've got these very long wings. They fly very slow because they're actually either poisonous or not, don't taste. I haven't eaten many butterflies, but they say that these are not very good tasting. But they don't really fly away and they, you know, and, but these heliconids, as you went down through the, from the heights down into the Amazon Valley, they change very subtly and, and some are found at some heights and some are found at other heights. And it goes all the way down to the tropical a rainforest. And this is just one of those things that, that uh, it's just pretty. <laughs> what can I say? I'm even modest, right? I just love these guys. So, so I tell you, there's one thing that I think that you're going to, there's probably two things that you're going to end up thinking today. Either you're going to go home thinking that evolution is marvelous or you're going to believe in some higher being. Because how on earth could this all happen without some direction? I don't believe in that. I believe that it's evolution. But, uh, and, and this drop, this eye-spotted drop. Now, we're going to get into some drops here, okay? So kind of remember, this is a theme of drops. This is my backpack. And so this is what I carry all my camera in. I just I throw this on my back, and I'm always throwing it down on the ground, but this is what I carry my, my, all of my photographic equipment in, and this you see is the top of that right here, and that's because when, you're, when it's 25 or 30 degrees Celsius, which would be what, 85 or 90 down here, you sweat a lot, and there's a lot of sweat on here, and, it, and I'll show you a picture of, of the malachite. We were walking back, and all of a sudden, everybody's looking, my brief, my, my, Backpack was down here, and then everybody's walking down looking at it. Turns out there was this beautiful malachite butterfly on it, but I'll show you that in a minute. So this is the eye spotted drop, you know. There's the eye spots, and that's the top of it. I mean, it is just unbelievable. You can't imagine this thing, and then it folds up its wings, and you got this eye spotted drop. Here you go again. Interestingly enough, on the ground. If you defocus your eyes, you can see how that actually is very difficult to spot. It really blends right in with the background. Again, you can see it here, the little proboscis. Look at these little antennae. If you can see these the little stripes, they're absolutely gorgeous. So this is, the, this is the eye spot. This is the drop with glasses. <laughs> Don't you love it? <laughs> and look at what he's doing. He's checking out my, my uh, backpack. And this is the white drop. I forgot the drops all together. But the white drop is, look at this. You can just get that hint of the beautiful blue on the top of this white drop here. You see the blue right there peeking through? There it is again with his little proboscis. And there he is on this metal handrail. And again, if you check out these white spots here, uh, you can't see them really, but you can actually, if, if they don't always cooperate, but you can see them actually right through the wing there. So this guy, this orange mark, normally, if you see butterfly photographs in a magazine, you've always, they've always got their wings up like this, you immediately know that that's a dead butterfly that they photographed. Okay? This guy, I tried to get him to raise his wings because he's got a, it's really pretty down here, but he just, for some reason or other, decided that that's the way he should have his, he or she, um, have his wings. But here you can see, if I've got a picture of the underside, you'll see this one white dot. There's another one on a leaf. 
And oh, here, this guy's catching a. See that cricket right there? He's he's going to go for a ride in a minute. He's he's not going to expect when this guy decides he wants to take off this little itty bitty cricket. I didn't even see him when I took the picture. It wasn't until I got back and started looking at the at the pictures that I said. I, and then what I you know you can't see until you put them on get them blow them up on a computer. And uh, so that's actually a little cricket catching a, catching a ride on a butterfly. You never know. Maybe he's an invasive species. So this is a little sex. This is this is called black lace, and you can, and I'm telling you, when you when I saw this butterfly the first time, it was like 15 feet away, and I said, oh my God! So I took it, thinking it wouldn't come close, and and I walked down the 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 the, uh, the walkway, and was at a little place, and and he just followed, he or she just followed me right up to this, and then you can see right through the wings, see then. So the question is. Why on earth would you have red down here, right? Well, because you want to protect what's right here, right? So if you've got a little dash of red there, if you've got somebody that wants to come and eat you, what are they going to do? They're going to come after the red, and they end up with nothing but a little bit of tail, and you can fly away. <laughs> this crimson banded black is... is I. It's a beautiful butterfly. The best photograph I got, unfortunately, was on my finger. Um, I, I didn't really get... Well, there is one here. So this is really cool. This is a tough picture to take because you have to take it off autofocus because this guy is actually five or six feet away from you on the tree. And you see what's right here? A beetle. What's that beetle doing? That beetle is eating the bark. And it's then sap is coming out, and this guy's a sap sucker. <laughs> so that's that's the crimson, and then uh, this is this is actually a very pretty picture. Well, I think it's a pretty picture. I love it when you can get that light just coming off of the the wings like that. This is a great picture. This is the vermilion spot. I didn't print this up because it's not a very good specimen, but it's one of the. Did I tell you that I, of the 400 species in five days, I got photographs of 99 species? So this is this is one that, that's a, a photograph, but it's it's a photograph in waiting. You know, I'm going to have to go back uh, and and find him in a better position. Here's a little tiny brown apex. Now that little guy is only about this big. It's a tiny little butterfly, and. Uh, but really spectacular. We don't have anything like that in, in the temperate zones. So I should also back up and say that if you're going from the North Pole and the South Pole towards the equator, the numbers of butterflies, the different species, goes up as you get closer to the equator. So when I went, so one of my next talks is going to be a talk on yellow-eyed penguins. I haven't told Susan this. But uh, when I went to New Zealand on my sabbatical in 2003, I went thinking that I would teach a little chemistry and do a lot of butterfly photography. But I forgot that it's so bloody cold in New Zealand that, they, you know, you can only... I mean, I woke up in the middle of the summer. It was 4 degrees Celsius, like 40 degrees. And I asked Barry, I said, my God, Barry, I said, if it's this cold in the summer, what's it going to be like in the winter? He said, warmer. <laughs> the bottom line was... There, was, there were no butterflies flying. I did see some. So I ended up doing a whole bunch of photography on penguins and spent 400 hours on the beach with my beloved yellow-eyed penguins, uh, mega, Megadiptes, uh, 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 dip, uh, oh gosh, no, Megadiptes, oh dear, I forgot the species. But anyway, that's my next talk. And I got a really cool video to show you of six-day-old chicks being fed by their adult. And you can even hear the adult uh, regurgitate. So that's the next one. Well, I got it. I actually I got two more talks. I got that, and then I'm doing some work on the plastic ocean. So we got to introduce you to the plastic ocean. So this is a this is a really fascinating, frustrating butterfly because there's two or three species that look very similar to this. So what I want you to note here is that this guy really behaved well in the rules. You see, the yellow and the white doesn't mix. You know, so he's got very good definition there in that little white spot right there. This is, I think, this is another one just like that. It's the same species, but this may be, it's a much darker form, so it could be a, a male or female. It could be the differentiation. And this is the bottom of it, so you can see beautiful, intricate, uh, 
Now, if this butterfly closes its wings and it's on a tree, you'll never see it. It'll look like just like a dead leaf. And you'll never see it. But then look at this guy. It wasn't quite so good. You see, his white kind of blended in with the yellow here. And he's got a couple extra spots. You see what happened? This is called, in organic chemistry, this is called an SN2 reaction where you have a push-pull, you know. So he pushes off the yellow here, and this is the exiting uh, this is the leaving group in our SN2 reaction. Sergey knows that. Uh, so you see, this is, a, this is an SN2 reaction in organic chemistry where you have a little push on one side and you, you break off the other side. So you think we're in the same species, right? Wrong. This is the red princess. This is, this is notable because as I was photographing this butterfly, up in the tree was a toucan. So I got a picture of a toucan too here. Not yet. But I mean, this is so cool. I mean, you cannot imagine. I mean, here you are photographing and you look up and there's a toucan up there looking at you. I love it. That's the red princess. There's little Ocho Ocho checking me out. And he's checking out this little um, sapphire as well. When this butterfly flies, it's like a little morpho. I mean, it just, you know, it darts around and you, and you just can't help but follow it. You know, you're going like this, you just about fall down from, from following this butterfly around. But it is absolutely magnificent. Look at these subtle blues on this. Interestingly enough, it has a green pro proboscis. I'm not quite sure what the significance of a green proboscis is. But it is known that the butterflies are going green. I mean, they've heard about going green. So you see, this guy is starting at the front end. <laughs> He's got a green proboscis. That's good. This little guy. Oh, my God. I So we walked for, I don't know, maybe two miles and then down a little falls and I was at the bottom of the falls, and next time I go, I'm going to spend at least two days down there. This was right by a waterfall. And this guy, if, you, if you're a bit queasy, and, you, and you're going to see something here in a minute with this guy. So it wasn't really polite uh, in front, in mixed company here. But this is, this blaze, I would wish that the she or he would just lift its wings up, because this purple under here is unbelievable. And you see these things flying around, and I mean, you just can't believe it. Look at that. And then this is what it looks like when it closes its wings, almost exactly like the rocks. I mean, if it's sitting there with its wings closed, I guarantee you, you will not see it. But then I was observing the fact that it was drinking water here. And look at what I did. There it is, peeing right in front of us. It could suck it in one one end and pee it out the other end. That's the that, residence time is about ten seconds. <laughs> so you wonder why it's drinking. I'm not sure exactly why either, but uh, it was fun doing that. First time I've ever seen that. Actually, I've lost my clicker. Here we go. Okay. This is the Paul Amacha Rio Royal. This butterfly, now this is a big butterfly. This is about, well, what it would be, eight, eight centimeters, two and a half inches, something like that. Underneath, it looks just like this. Reminds you of a monarch, doesn't it? Now, what I want you to do is I want you to, and that actually it made me think because I had, um, unfortunately, uh, I didn't tell Susan I was bringing some photographs. I actually brought 80 photographs, and we got a bunch of them out on the table out there. There's another 55 hiding over here behind the desk. But I had I had these guys, this one and another species, and I think I've identified a potential of mimicry. Now do you know mimicry? You know the 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 um, monarch butterfly eats plants that have got a lot of alkaloids in them. And alkaloids, if a a bird eats that butterfly, they can actually die at the worst and at, at the best they may just get a have a bad day in the GI tract. But if you'll just kind of defocus and look at these wings in a bit, I'll, I'll point that out and you can see underneath. I mean, this is just spectacular. Look at this little eye here. Now, these are compound eyes. It looks like he's looking right at me. This is where you commune with these butterflies. You know, you got to kind of get to know these guys. <laughs> then, then this one, look at this. You can see here's the water and this is a rock. 
You, you never know what you're taking. The pictures, you never know until the night when you come back. This is this other butterfly, and see, Ocho Ocho showed up again. <laughs> He's keeping an eye on me the whole time, keeping me honest. If you defocus from this, and, and I don't know if I did it or not, I was going to try to put this one right next to the other one, and I think this is mimicking the other one. And so I started the story and forgot. The monarch eats these plants that have got alkaloids in them. The viceroy is very good tasting. Mind you, I've not really eaten either the monarch or the viceroy. But they say that the birds love viceroys. But the viceroy mimics the monarch. And I'm thinking that this guy may be good tasting and the other guy is bad tasting because he's flashing it out there saying, hey, I've got these white wings and this beautiful, beautiful orange underside. Don't eat me because I eat nasty plants. This guy on the other side, look at this. It is unbelievable. You look at these things. I keep losing my button here. You look at this. This, it, can you imagine? Every one of these. So you know that the, the wing is just a bunch of scales, right? And you know that where they came from was just a, a bug. It's just a caterpillar. They, go, they start out as an egg. They go into a caterpillar. Then butterflies go through a chrysalis. And then they emerge as these gorgeous creatures. And the definition on this what I do on my computer is I, I, I hit the enlarge, 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 enlarge. I go up like eight times. You can actually see individual uh, scales on the, on the wing of that butterfly. And the beautiful thing is about the photography is that you never touch them. So they just fly off and they can enjoy another day. And you can see generally these, a butterfly that's this perfect probably emerged that day. Because when they just by merely flying around, they lose these scales and stuff. And you think, the thing that's interesting here, you can see this little green seed. See, there, he's eating it right there. He's eating whatever's on it. I don't know whether it's water or whether it's some of the oils that are naturally there on the, on the food. And then you, then you look up and there it is in the tree above you. And you see these, look at these spots. It's so cool. Oh, then we got this guy. This guy is really frustrating because he's got a gorgeous, gorgeous color and he loves to sit just like this. But you can see his little proboscis here. He's checking me out. But look at this red antennae. So he hasn't heard about going green yet. It's kind of getting there with the, with, with the proboscis. It's a little bit yellow, but he needs a little bit. But then look at this. This guy's flying by. So if you've ever wondered, and I know you all have, what does a butterfly do with his legs when he's flying? He just drapes them and flies. That is, I wasn't going to, I just put that in the other day thinking that that's kind of cool. But this is what this butterfly looks like when it starts to open its wings. Look at that. This is the light just reflecting off the end of the wing. You just wish the thing would just open its wings and just say, hey, take my picture, you know. I gotta figure out how to get them to do that. Oh my God, this one. This, I can tell you, I was walking down a, down, just out of the hotel. I was no more than three or four minutes from the hotel. And I was walking down, and this guy flew by, and I said, oh my God. I have never, and I, of course, I'm sitting here taking, I took about 20 pictures in about, well, less than a minute. And look at this blue here. This is called the spotted wing. And, and it's very interesting because the camera has a hard time focusing on this guy because look at this red here. You, it looks like it's bleeding and it makes it very difficult to focus on that butterfly. And therefore, the enemies, when it's flying around, it's obviously not very, it's not very well hidden at all. But it's, with, it's, it's very difficult to focus as a bird if you were going to eat it or as me as a photographer because the darn camera can't figure out where, where, the, where the wings are. Look at that. I'm not sure I'd call it, what did he call it? Something spots. I think I'd call it blue underwing. I only got about, I mean, I tell you, this is, this is five days that I think I must have lost about 20 pounds because I was, I'm in total, I normally do live in the excited state because I do photochemistry and radiation chemistry. So a lot of my friends know that I live in the excited state. But I'm telling you, five days of this stuff and you're about exhausted. 
but it is unbelievable. I love this because, because this reminds me of, of, of actually a, a group of uh, butterflies up north here we call question marks and commas, actually. They look, have the similar wing. And when you open it up, you can see, look at that white right there. The Hovey. This is really cool. Watch this. If it works. Sometimes it doesn't work. Going backwards here is a little bit slow, so we'll see if we can speed up. Oh, sorry. I went the wrong way. Okay. When I've got more control over this, uh, I can't do it. It looks like it's flying. If I could do it back fast enough, it looks like it's flying. You know, I get it. The other day, it flew right off of there into my living room. <laughs> but this this blue, there's nothing like that up here in the in the northern in the in the temperate latitudes. You really only find this this color blue in. Um, in the southern latitudes. This little guy, look at this swallowtail up here. To give you an idea of how small this butterfly is, it's not called little for, for no reason. It's tiny. It's only about this big. And here's your big swallowtail right up there, Papilio, right there. This is Maya. Everybody likes this. I think it's really an ugly butterfly. But, well, as butterflies go, of course. But it, uh, if you look at the underside of Mario here, can you imagine it sitting on a, a stick like this on a tree, and you'd think it was a dead, uh, a dead leaf, actually. And we have some. The Rudy Dagger wing is a, is a subtropical species that we have here in the United States, in, in, uh, at least in Florida. Looks a lot like this, with this big, long wing. And all this intricate color here is only to camouflage it when it doesn't want to be seen. But then you see it up here in the tree and you think, oh my God, that is gorgeous. Look at these little orange guys. They're just little flaps. And I think it's the same reason uh, as before. It's really just to distract somebody that wants to come and eat it, to keep it away from the vital parts of the front there. Here is your morpho. This, so the morpho is the one that everybody sees and they're mounted beautiful, brilliant blue. And did you know that the color of the wing isn't blue at all? All of the, the scales ha are actually three-dimensional and they actually reflect, refract the light. And the blue comes from a refraction, not because it's colored blue. But so I actually got three three different morpho species, but I only uh, the the other one wasn't a very good picture. I didn't get a good picture, so I didn't put that in. But then this guy, oh my God, this guy's huge, just like this big. And we were walking down the path, and all of a sudden, <laughs> this huge blue butterfly is flying around. You think, oh my God, you know, you're kind of ducking and everything, and they're not scared of you a bit. They couldn't care less about you. They're so big. They're they're the they're the they're the, they're the lion of the butterfly species. But what was really interesting is I got lucky, and that's the butterfly flying away. That's the upper side of the blue that you see when they're mounted. So this is the, this is the morpho sitting on the leaf here, and this is him flying away, and this was just dead luck. I mean, there's no skill involved in that at all. I had no idea that I even did that. But it was, it's really cool. You can see the beautiful... Uh, colors along the outside of the wing here. This little guy, the small round, is, is about this big, tiny little thing. And uh, actually, when I was identifying these, so look at this. He's got little match. This is one of these color-coordinated guys. He's got little orange tips on his antennae here. This one is not the same species, and I didn't realize it until I was going through the, in... I thought it was, but you see how this got a hump in the wing here? It actually turns out that this was my 99th species. I thought I only had 98, and I was going for 100, uh, but I got up to 99 and had to stop. So that's not actually the same one. Look at this, though. This is the same. This is the first one I showed you. This is down at the bottom of the waterfalls, and he's in there drinking a little bit of water. Look at that. See, now you see there's, this wing is pretty straight here. And that's the difference between the little round and the other one, which I honestly don't remember what the, the name it is. This is called the long wing. It's actually very, it's very long like this. And uh, you can see one of these guys that's misbehaving over here. You see, his, he's pushing out that yellow. That's the SN2 reaction over there.
This is a, again, I didn't I didn't print this up because it's not it's it's an interesting butterfly, but it's not a pretty butterfly. It's a little bit older. You can see it's lost a lot of its. Uh, uh, but I wanted to just try to show you that not every butterfly is perfect down there. Darn close to it, but <laughs> that's why I have to go back. You see, I mean, there's always a reason to go back. You've got to go back and find that perfect butterfly. This, this butterfly, I mean, look at these red eyes. woo And then this, this red along here. I mean, it is unbelievable. And then when it flies, it's just flashing this red and white and black. And, oh, my God, it's unbelievable. See, this guy got scared. He took off. There's one of our, our blind spots there. And this is this guy on the on the water. I taught this, I took this photograph at 8:15 in the morning, exactly 8:15, not 13 and not 17. 8:15, I was walking over to to jump on the little train so I could go up and, and play in the sewage. <laughs> and I actually found I was looking actually at another butterfly, and I just looked and I said, Oh my God, look at this thing! I have never seen. I mean, this is this is unbelievable. And look at how beautiful the red in here. It's called the Illusion, actually. Um, and I about lost it with the Illusion, I'll tell you. I mean, these blues, I mean, how could Mother Nature do this? How could she make all these phenomenal colors just for us? So we're going to come back to the Malachite. The Malachite is actually also found in Miami. And this friend of mine who was a microbial ecologist there and I were both kind of butterfly um, collectors and we would, they'd see us running around the campus trying to catch these guys at, at, uh, in Miami. These are really spectacular butterflies. It's not a particularly phenomenal picture, but it is just show you how it it's, uh, blends in. And actually the best picture I think I got actually, well, there's, this is the one that was on my backpack. And I'd gone down this, because I was chasing a butterfly. You can't keep me still in, these, in the forest. So I was chasing another butterfly. I looked back, and everybody was looking at my brief, at my backpack. And, and that's because this guy was on there sucking my sweat. <laughs> see, that gives you a clue. You see, I'm from the upper gentry, right? Because I got good smell and sweat. <laughs> you see, you got it. This is all important. In, in this, you know, you have to know where you fit in the scheme of life. <laughs> and he loves my saliva <laughs> on top of it all. This is really tough. I mean, you get these big butterflies. It, it, oh, God, it's a fun. It's... This skipper. So we're going to get now, I think there's a bunch of skippers. Skippers, uh, we have about 2,000 species of skippers in the United States. And we got a bunch of them down there. This is really intricate, how the, 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 the wings go in this beautiful darkish blue and the lighter blue. And I'll show you what makes it a skipper uh, in a minute. It's a, it's a curved antennae. Here's another skipper. And if you think that the antennae are just there for nothing, you can watch these guys take their antennae and walk around. They're looking for things. They're actually using them as a sensory uh, perception to try to figure out where to put their little proboscis. So I had to put little armor in there because he's really pretty ugly. <laughs> then you get another skipper. Look at this guy. I mean, I have never seen anything like this. I mean, this brilliant, here you got the brown and the white and then all of a sudden this blue and it turns almost into a green. And I mean, I saw that thing and I went, went crazy. Here's another little skipper. Um, and I'm not sure if this is really what the, the, the name of this or the species is actually. I, I, these are so difficult to identify. Impossible here. This guy's got a long tail. We have a tailed skipper here in the United States. But our tailed skipper doesn't have as fat a little body as this guy does. But you see, can you see the antennae here, how they're hooked? That's how you can tell. I, well, you can see actually better almost in the, in the uh, shadow there. It's a hooked antennae, and that's what differentiates. There you go. See this hooked antennae here? A normal butterfly has got a clubbed antennae, and the, the hook here differentiates it, the butterflies, from these skippers. And um, a moth, for example, has got a feathery antenna. And if you see a moth with a big feathery antenna, it's a male. 
because the females emit the sex attractant pheromone. We've, I, that's one thing I did do. I did actually publish 12 papers in moth research at one point in time, and uh, uh, so we, so we would we would we would rear these these beautiful beautiful silkworm moths, and then we had a we had a little cage, and the and the females the males could have been known to follow the the scent, if you will, the sex attractant pheromone for a mile. So it's thought that in the antennae of these male silkworm moths, you actually generate uh, about a millivolt of potential in the brain. And it's that end, it's it's that voltage which steers them up. They go like this until they find the female. This is pretty impressive here with this. We have, we have a, a skipper that looks a lot like this. Here you can really see that curved antennae there. This Libra is actually a skipper, and you can't see it, but you, can, you can't see the antennae very much, but you can see the shadows, how they're curved there. This little orange skipper. This is where, now don't, you know, this is very important. This is where they got the design for the F-15. <laughs> the Air Force used to study these little skippers. Because these guys, you know, with their little tails or their little wings up. I mean, that's how you get mobility in the air. And skippers are known as skippers because they're very, very fast flying. They're very agile butterflies. Here you've got the clawed skipper. Now, this guy is really tiny. He's only about a centimeter. We have nothing that looks anywhere close to that in the United States. But it is a skipper. Yep. This one... I couldn't believe it. I've never seen a yellow skipper, but look at these wing, look at these antennae. Surely hook. And this guy is just unbelievable. We have nothing that, that's anywhere close to that. We have some that look like this. And the, the interesting thing here is, of course, the shape of this butterfly is very similar to ones you'll find here. If you do, if you're a scuba diver, for example, and you dive in the Caribbean, which is where I started diving, and then you go to the Pacific, the interesting thing there is all of the fish. Uh, they've got the same shape because they've evolved into the same ecological niche, but they're all different colors because they've got different different patterns that they're trying to, to work on. This is the elf, pretty boring butterfly. I don't tell them that when we're in nature. It's only when I come back up here. This is the little yellow bands. Now, this is the little yellow, the little red devil. I mean, to tell you, wait till you see its butt. Look at that. <laughs> red head, red tail. You know why the tail's red, right? You want to you want to direct them away from the the vital organs. So when somebody comes in after him, he gets his his uh, mouth full of tail here and the and this guy can fly away. But look at the iridescence on this thing. It's unbelievable. I mean, I I, I wish I could show these to E.O. Wilson. I have to talk to Francisco Ayala here. Brown skipper, dark. These, I'm telling you, to try to, to try to actually get these. I have, I gave up putting the scientific names in there. I do have the scientific names for all of these things, but I'm just a chemist, so I don't really go in for those. This is, this actually looks, my friends Steve and Nancy right there have got a dog that looks just like this. <laughs> The crazy thing about that dog is if you have a laser like this, he'll chase that bloody thing all over the living room, just like this guy did. I had the laser sprayers going around. But doesn't that look like a dog's face? I think they should call it the dog face skipper. Here's another yellow skipper, unidentified as yet. So I have 99 species, but there's two or three of my 99 that I couldn't actually determine what the genus and species was. This is, again, one of those bland guys, unidentified. You can see why. I mean, you know, what, what sort of markings do you have there? This is the telus. This is really a, an interesting picture. You've got these really interesting lines back here in the long tail. And you can see here clearly that this is a skipper. Can you see that butterfly? That's a skipper. <laughs> you talk about camouflage. So... My dream, and I actually, I actually did a book at Ritz, but it didn't come in in time to bring it to show you tonight. My dream is to put together a, a coffee table book called The Butterflies of Iguazu. My problem is getting the $20,000 it'll take me to, to print up a thousand copies. So I was gonna, I was gonna bring one in and say, hey, anybody want a pre-publication copy? 
we could sell it to you for less than ten thousand dollars. <laughs> but one of the one of the areas in my my mind's eye in my book is going to be a series of photographs in the middle of the book called camouflage, because I tell you there's some pictures. That, that are even harder to spot the, the, the little butterfly than right here. And, and I think that's kind of interesting because if you don't see this thing land, you will not see it because it's only about a centimeter in, in size anyway. This is called the parrot's beak. And this is, I should have actually put the first one. Look at this. Here it is sitting here with its, its proboscis here. And then it just crawled right up in there and stuck its proboscis all the way down in there right in there and getting the pollen and any nectar that was in there. Now, there are, there are, um, yeah, there are, yeah, I'm getting old, this is terrible. There are, there are, there have been some evolutionary developments where a specific moth will be designed for a specific flower. Oh, it's a yucca moth and the yucca flower. And they, and it's, the only way that yucca flower can get fertilized is, is something similar to this. This happens to be a skipper. You can see that the curved antennae here. But my guess is that he's also fertilizing that plant right there as he gets in and he sticks his proboscis in there and gets that sweet nectar. See that? Good night. So here we got a little guy here with a big huge body and you can see his little Proboscis getting down there, getting the water. That's at the bottom of the falls. Here he is again. Bloomfield's Beauty. This is another one of those very, very frustrating butterflies because I couldn't get it to open up its wing. The best shot I got is about like this. But if you talk about an intricate underwing, look at that. And if that's in the right environment, you can't see that butterfly at all. It's 100% camouflaged. And, and it's just like zebras. You know, you wouldn't think that a zebra could get camouflaged, but it's amazing how this breaking up this pattern, doesn't this kind of remind you of our military? That's the uniforms they wear. You see, the military's not so dumb. They follow the butterflies. The F-15, the F-14, that's our camouflage suits for the desert. This is a uh, papilio, a swallowtail, and these are very difficult to photograph because when I'm dealing with my 200 millimeter telephoto and my extender, I've only got a depth of field that's probably less than a centimeter. So you can see here that, if I can find me a little, see down here it's kind of out of focus. It's in really good focus here, and this wing is sitting up, so it doesn't take much to be out of focus. When I can take off my telephoto and put on my 50 millimeter because these guys aren't scared of you, then I get a bigger depth, a broader depth of field. The depth of field talks about the amount of the picture that's in focus. Okay? So I've got, I don't know if I actually, I was going to put a, a good example of a depth of field. Oh my God, look at that one. There's my mauve. I've never really quite figured out what mauve is because that makes no sense to me, but that's, they say that's mauve, so now I know. This is a big butterfly. This butterfly is about this big. It's, it's, a, huge, it's a huge butterfly. Not to be outdone by the, the one with the white. Look at this. So here you got red. Now, at least in the papilio that I know, if you've got a lot of blue down here, then that signifies that it's a female um, in the red here. So I'm not sure if that's the same down there. In, as I said, I'm not really a professional entomologist, and I don't know a lot of the stuff, the details about the science. But what's amazing is how these lines break up this black wing and, and actually make it uh, a less... And now you've got the yellow thing here. You see there's a little bit of blue there. So... Um, if you get into some of the, the spice bush swallowtail, the black swallowtail in the United States, there's a lot of blue in the females. This is the blunt. Look at this. There's your zebra. But you see, it's, it's important. It's color coordinated. You see, you've got orange tips and orange wing. That's very important in butterflies. There's another blunt. This is the tiger butterfly. This thing's amazing. 
this is this is this is your handrail again. Look at these little spindly. Now it's an insect, so it's got six legs, but many of them only use four legs. And you can see it's got its proboscis down here. And look at this outline. Then you look at this, and you'd swear to God that I actually killed that butterfly and pinned it there, wouldn't you? I didn't, honest to God. It's alive. That's the other side. I don't know. I think I actually I think they're tucked up right up in here. I don't think they're degenerated. I think they do have six legs. But there's a lot of butterflies actually that walk just on four legs. Can you imagine? I mean, we have a hard enough time walking on two. If it, with four, my God, you'd never. Look at this. Now we're getting into some woodland species. This is the little flash. Now this guy is only is about an inch or so. This is our elf again. Ugly butterfly. This little coin is impressive, isn't it? Look at this head. <laughs> that's the uniform. That's a probably a pretty good name. It's pretty much uniform. But you know that's the bottom because you see you see this hole in the tr in the leaf right here. There it is right there. So you know it's the same butterfly, so I didn't lie. Look at that head. Kind of reminds you of the big horn sheep, right? You know, the elk, the butt heads. So that's pretty much it in the butterflies. This was the guy that joined, met me every day as I went out of the out of the hotel. And I still don't know what it is, but it's a gorgeous bird. This little guy... It's really cool. Now, I have to tell you the story. I have a thing about little girls. So I had this malachite on my hand, and two little girls and their mom and dad came along, didn't speak a word of English, and I didn't speak a word of Spanish, but we communicated with no trouble at all. And I said, hold your hand out, and I just actually put my hand right next to her hand, and she had this gorgeous malachite on her on her hand. I almost could guarantee you that she'll never forget that. And look at her baby sister, her little sister. I mean, when she had the biggest brownest eyes, I almost asked her if I could adopt her. You know, I mean, I wanted to take her. Home. But you know, this is how you get kids interested in nature. You show them the opportunity to interact. And you could see that the mom and dad were just excited as could be to have their little daughters have a chance to have a butterfly on their finger like this. And it was really, really fun. I mean, it really is exciting. And one of my missions in life is to try to make, make a difference, you know. And I like to think that doing something like this that's very simple makes a difference. So that's not one Cody, that's two Cody's. <laughs> One going to the right and one going to the left. <laughs> we, were, <laughs> we were coming along. These guys, these guys are all over. I have got some of the cutest pictures of baby Cody's. I probably should have put them in, but I figured I'd bore you to death. But here we're going this way. These guys are going this way. This is a green fly in midair looking at me. So I said, well, if you're going to look at me, I'm going to photograph you. You know, these guys are the ones with the little helicopter. <laughs> Look at this guy. Green with this beautiful metallic blue and green. There's my friend the toucan. Don't you love it? <laughs> so he was even eaten. Okay. So what's, what's next in, in my life for butterfly photography? God only knows. But I do plan on going back to Iguazu Falls because I think what I have in my mind's eye is that there are four seasons. Even though it's at 24 degrees, which means you don't have much difference in temperature and much difference um, in the amount of light, but you do have a difference in the flowers and the trees that are blooming at different times. So at the very least, if I had a good paper, the AGU, the American Geophysical Union, is, is, uh, has a meeting next summer in Iguazu, darn it. Unfortunately, I'm going to be out at sea on an oceanographic trip. But uh, the idea is to go back 
uh, in their winter, our summer, and spend some time in it. Ideally, I'd go back in the spring and the fall. Now, remind you, there's 400 species, and I only photographed 99, so I got 300 to go. And I'm sure I could get some pretty pictures of, of the ones that I've got, too. And I'm also planning uh, a coffee table book uh, on the butterflies of Iguazu. I think I've got enough photographs from this trip to have one coffee table book, and then I would do maybe a series. So, so but before, before we do this, I need to, need to do one last thing. This is canon through the eyes of a butterfly. If you've ever seen National Geographic, it's always nature, you know, looking through canon. Well, this is, this is this beautiful purple butterfly that's gone green with this proboscis. And, of course, Susan doesn't know this yet, but I'm also going to give a talk here on the plastic ocean. And if you guys haven't seen a booby lately, this was the guy I was lecturing in the middle of the Pacific this summer is a red-footed booby. Every morning when we were about six or 700 miles north, of, I sailed a, a 50-foot catamaran from Honolulu to Long Beach looking for plastic. And every morning when we were close to Hawaii, six or 700 miles away, we'd have seven or eight of these uh, blue-footed boobies uh, on, the, on the bow, which the captain hated because you know what happens when you have birds <laughs> on, your, on your bow. But I loved it because I wanted to do a, a, a picture. So thank you very, very much. Uh,